just the first things that came out of her mouth was Christine was murdered. And uh, I just instantly fell to the ground. The way in which the defendant killed both of these women was extremely and outrageously wicked and shockingly evil and vile. We have sat through graphic testimony and heard all of the positively gruesome details of how our girl met our end. We all know that the world can be a very scary place, but in my opinion, most people are truly good at their baseline and will make choices that do little to no harm on those around them because most people have empathy and don't want to be the cause of someone else's pain. But what makes the world truly scary is when we hear about those people who are totally void of emotion, those who lack empathy and live their lives without a care in the world for those around them. It's people like this that make the world terrifying at times, knowing that you can be a victim simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. That is what happened in today's case to two innocent, unsuspecting women, and the person at the center of it all is truly terrifying. But before we get into this tragic, horrifying case, if you're in the market for a new pair of earbuds that deliver premium audio at half the cost of bigger brands, then you are going to want to hear from today's sponsor, Raycon. If you haven't pulled the trigger yet on your new pair of Raycons, now is truly the time to check them out. They have just released their upgraded model of their best-selling everyday earbuds. These new and improved earbuds offer everything you love about Raycons plus more. You can enjoy the new ergonomic design, multi-point connectivity that lets your pair connect to two devices at once, and you get active noise cancellation. They also come in a variety of new, vibrant colors that complement any and all skin tones. I personally snagged a pair of their light purple earbuds, which I think are so unique looking and pair perfectly with my pink hair and most of my outfits. I personally use my Raycons every single day for working out and listening to music. I also use them for listening to podcasts when I'm doing cardio or doing chores around the house but sometimes I do forget to charge them, which can be a pain, but the new Raycons have a new quick charge function, which delivers 90 minutes of battery time with just a 10 minute charge, which is literally perfect for when I forget to charge them. I just put them on the charger while I'm in the car on the way to the gym, and boom, I have the perfect amount of battery life by the time I get there. Then, when fully charged, they still have an amazing battery life, offering 8 hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. The other thing I love about the new Everyday Earbuds is the multi-point connectivity. It was really nice to have when I was traveling. I connected them to both my phone for music and then to my iPad when I wanted to watch a movie. It was so nice to be able to seamlessly switch between both devices on the plane without having to disconnect and reconnect them. The other feature I love is their noise isolation versus awareness modes. The noise isolation feature allows you to be totally immersed in your music and block out outside noise, which is really nice when I just want to be dialed into my workout, but it's also nice to have the awareness mode for when I'm listening to something while on the go. For example, when I'm walking my dogs around the neighborhood, I want to be aware of my surroundings at all times, so awareness mode allows me to listen to my podcasts and music while also being aware of what's going on around me. Now, I know you will love your Raycons just as much as I love mine, so go ahead and give them a try out for yourself. Click the link in the description box below or head to buyraycon.com slash RSTC to get 15% off of your Raycon purchase plus free shipping. Once again, that's buyraycon.com slash RSTC to get 15% off of your Raycon purchase plus free shipping. Thank you again so much to Raycon for partnering with me on today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into today's wild ride of a case. Now, this case has been quite sensationalized because of the person who committed these brutal, horrific murders. While it is always interesting to see how someone is capable of what this man did, and we will dive into his behaviors and attitude later in the video, but as you all know, we are victim-focused on this channel, so let's start out by talking about 35-year-old Christine Melton and 43-year-old Diane Ruiz. Christine Melton grew up in Illinois, but spent her high school years living in Colorado. After that, she and her best friend Stephanie decided to move across the country together to Cape Coral, Florida. There, the two friends got jobs as waitresses at the same restaurant. By the time of her death, she was living alone in Cape Coral with her cat, who she absolutely adored. 
Those who knew Christine described her as being kind-spirited, quick-witted, and loving. She was just the type of person that you felt safe and comfortable around. She loved dressing up, so of course her favorite holiday was Halloween. She loved traveling with hopes of someday traveling the world and getting to know all of the different cultures and experiences the world has to offer. She was also known to be extremely close to her mother who lived only a block away from her. Christine and her mother were described as being two peas in a pod. By around 10 p.m. on October 6, 2019, Christine and her friend Stephanie headed in an Uber to Buddha Bar to hang out and listen to the band that was playing live music there. The two drank and danced and just had a good time together. This was something the pair would often do. It wasn't anything special for them. It wasn't an occasion or anything out of the ordinary for them. Towards the end of the night, Christine and Stephanie started walking to the upstairs part of the bar when they were met with a man who introduced himself. According to Stephanie, this man introduced himself as JR and struck up a conversation. He was handsome, kind, and charming. After meeting JR, the group met another man, Jason, and from there, the group of four hung out and chatted the night away. At this point, everyone was in a good mood, everyone had been drinking, and the girls were just having fun. By the time the bar was closing down, JR, Stephanie, and Christine all headed to Jason's place where they spent several hours to continue hanging out and drinking. During that time, JR and Christine did hook up. By later in the morning on October 7th, Jason asked everyone to leave because he had to be up in a few hours for work on that Monday. JR got in the car and was going to drive Christine and Stephanie home, but the car was a stick shift and JR didn't know how to drive it. He was trying to get it into reverse, trying all sorts of maneuvers, making all sorts of noise, but just could not get it. Now, the car actually belonged to JR's girlfriend, which I will get more into later in the video, but that is the car that Jason must have used to get everyone to his place. I assume that because again, JR didn't know how to drive it, so when they were at the bar, I assume it was there and then Jason drove from the bar to their place. At that point, again, my assumption is that the women were too intoxicated to drive, and again, Jason had work. So that was why JR was trying to get the stick shift to work. Regardless, JR couldn't figure out the stick shift, so eventually the three decided just to get an Uber to Christine's apartment. Once there, Stephanie stayed for about 15 minutes, but she had to leave because she needed to pick up her son from school and needed to get herself to work. Before leaving Christine's place, she asked Christine if she was okay, which Christine said yes to, so she gave her a hug and said, see you tomorrow. After leaving Christine's place, Stephanie texted her several times throughout that day to check in and see how her day was going, but she wasn't responding. This didn't immediately concern Stephanie though because Christine didn't have too much going on that day. She didn't have work and didn't have any big plans, so she figured she must have been sleeping. That same morning on October 7th, 43-year-old Diane Ruiz left her home for the morning to go to work. She worked as a bartender at the Moose Lodge, which wasn't too far from her home, so she always opted to walk to work to get some fresh air. Diane was the mother of two sons, 29-year-old Brandon and 19-year-old Zane. Diane was described as being hardworking, loving, and caring. She absolutely adored her two boys and did everything in her power to show them how much she loved them every single day. That morning of Monday, October 7th, before leaving for work, she asked her son to start preparing chicken wings for when she got home that evening. Diane was supposed to begin her shift at 10 a.m. that day. However, coworkers immediately became concerned when she didn't show. Diane was well-loved by everyone at the Moose Lodge, and she was known as a dedicated employee, not missing a single shift in her five years of working there. So around 30 minutes after her shift was supposed to start, Co-workers called 911 to report Diane as missing. Right away, police set out on their search for Diane and pretty quickly, they found her purse on the ground near an elementary school located along the route she took to walk to work. Police then brought her purse to her home and spoke with her sons and her fiance about her disappearance. They all told her that she really had no reason to be near or at that school. She didn't have children who went there, no friends or family members who had students there. 
Finding her purse there was very strange. As all of this was going on, with Christine not getting back to Stephanie all day and Diane suddenly going missing, by later that same day on October 7th, 911 received a call from a man named Josh Lukic. 39-year-old Josh Lukic is the owner of Mateo Graphics in Cape Coral. Well, as he was at work, he told officers that a man pulled up to his building and ran in wearing no shirt or shoes, only pants. He was missing several teeth and was covered in blood. He described this man as acting frantic and manic, talking fast at him and pacing back and forth. The man told Josh that he needed to get out of town because he had just killed some people and rolled one of them up in a carpet or a blanket or something. He said he needed a bus ticket, a plane ticket, or something like that so he could get out as soon as possible. Now, this man was someone who Josh knew and was acquainted with, but they weren't close friends by any means. So, of course, he wasn't going to help this maniac escape. He was scared. So instead, he called 911, who arrived shortly after. But by the time they got there, the man had fled. But they did find the car he drove up in. It was a black Nissan Versa. Upon inspecting the car, they found blood inside, which prompted them to get into that car to search more. They wondered if maybe there could have been someone in that trunk or someone who had been attacked in that car was somewhere nearby. But there was nothing in that car. Just blood all over the interior and some on the exterior. However, after running the license and registration to that car, they realized that the car actually belonged to Christine Melton. Using this, they were able to find Christine's phone number to call her, but she wasn't answering any of their calls. Officers then went to her place of work, but none of her coworkers had seen her that day. After that, they went to her last known address to see if she was home, but after knocking, nobody came to the door. No one knew where Christine was and nobody was able to get a hold of her. Police went ahead and contacted Christine's emergency contact who then contacted Stephanie to ask her if she had seen Christine. But as we know from before, she hadn't seen or heard from her all day. Because of the fact that no one had seen or heard from Christine all day and her car was found with blood inside being driven by some maniac who just confessed to murder, police went back to her townhome to check on her. And that is when they found the body of 35-year-old Christine Melton. She was found lying on the floor in her home between her bedroom and bathroom, beaten to death with her body wrapped in bedding, several shirts, leggings, and a swimsuit top. Her face was absolutely covered in black and blue bruising. She had abrasions and bruising on her neck. Her hyoid bone was broken and all of her fingernails were broken. A later autopsy would confirm that she died as a result of asphyxia due to compression of the neck. 35-year-old Christine Melton had been brutally and violently beaten and strangled to death. Based on the scene, it appeared that the perpetrator had strangled her and then wrapped her body in whatever he could find, her bedding, her clothes, her swimsuit top. He then dragged her body out of the bedroom, most likely with the plan of taking her body out of the apartment altogether to dispose of her, but she is heavy, a lot heavier than he probably expected. So he gives up and leaves her there. He then takes her keys and cell phone before stealing her car and driving away. All of this is happening on the morning of October 7th. This 911 call is placed where this bloody man confesses to murder. Christine's car is found, which leads to the discovery of her body. At the same time that all of that was happening, 911 had received yet another call at 8.48 a.m. This call was made to report a fight that was happening between a man and a woman at a local spa. When officers arrived, the woman who made the call told officers that her friend, Melissa Montanez, was just assaulted by her boyfriend. Police spoke with Melissa, and she told them that the night prior, she too had been at Buddha Bar with friends. That night, she had gotten into an argument with her boyfriend, which resulted in him storming away and leaving. By the following day, Melissa was working at the spa, Mila's Spa, which is actually her business that she runs. That entire morning, her boyfriend had been trying to call her over and over and over again from a number she didn't recognize. She had been asleep during most of the calls, but by around 8 a.m., she woke up and saw that he was calling and finally answered. When she answered, he was screaming at her, asking her to meet up to talk. 
She reluctantly agreed, telling him to meet her at her place of business. At this point, she was concerned for her well-being. She basically just wanted to appease him by allowing him to meet up with her and talk, but she wanted to make sure it was somewhere public in case he did anything crazy. Again, he saw just how angry and volatile he was acting, so she asked her coworker and friend to be present when he got there. When he arrived, as she pretty much expected, he was angry and acting extremely aggressively. He immediately started attacking Melissa as soon as he got there. He tried grabbing Melissa and pulling her into the car, but she was able to fight him off and get away. He then got out of the car to chase after her, but he failed to put the car in park, so the car rolled backwards and hit another car. He then grabbed Melissa again and pulled her by her hair, dragging her into the spa. Once inside, he punched her in the face and then pins her against the wall and bites her right ear and starts strangling her. Finally, she is able to fight him off, running as fast as she could to a neighboring business. At this time, Melissa identified her boyfriend as 30-year-old Wade Wilson, who stands at 6 feet 5 inches tall, weighing about 230 pounds, while she was only 5'2 and about 130 pounds. She said that the two had been dating for about six months. They had lived together for two months, but for about three months of their relationship, Wade was in jail for other charges. He was known to use drugs like cocaine and meth at the time, and while he was in jail, Melissa continued to support him emotionally and financially. Then, when he got out, they continued their relationship until the night of October 6th when they had that big fight. After the attack, Wade fled, so he was not present when police got there, but Melissa did mention that he was driving a black Nissan Versa, which again was the car stolen from Christine, which also had blood in it. Now, going back to the car, police did do forensic testing on the blood within that car to see if it was a match to Christine, or maybe it was a match to himself. Maybe the attack started in the car. But after the testing was done for the DNA, they found that the blood was actually a match for 43-year-old Diane Ruiz. So not only is this man connected to Christine's murder, but this connected him to Diane's disappearance as well. Of course, for the days that followed her disappearance, Diane's family held their breath as they waited for answers for what happened to her. Because of how sudden her disappearance was, they knew that something had to have happened to her. And now that her blood was found within that car, which is connected to a vicious assault and another murder, her family members were hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. And tragically, by October 10th, the family's worst fears were confirmed. 43-year-old Diane's body was found in an empty lot behind a Sam's Club covered in shrubs in Cape Coral after investigators saw vultures circling the sky in that area. I feel like that's a very eerie way of finding a body. When Diane's body was found, she too was badly bruised and covered in injuries. She was found to have broken her nose. Her hyoid bone and thyroid cartilage were broken. She had multiple anterior and posterior rib fractures. She had died a horrific, brutal, violent death. Her cause of death was determined to be the result of strangulation and blunt force trauma. Based on how Diane's body was found, as well as from evidence found from Christine's car, police determined that Diane was walking on the sidewalk, making her way to work, and then during her walk, she was met with a man, most likely Wade Wilson, who approached her in Christine's car. Eventually, he was able to get Diane's attention. When she got talking to him, she somehow ended up in the car. We don't know if this was willingly under some sort of guise or unwillingly by force. What we do know is that once she was in that car, she was strangled and then taken to another location from where her purse was found. At that location, a witness reports that he saw a car backing up and pulling forward in the streets multiple times, like around 10 times before driving off. That witness didn't think much of it at first until he saw police cars and crime scene tape days later. This is the location where Diane's body was found. So, after seeing all of this, the witness made the connection and realized that he witnessed a car backing up and driving over this woman's body 
over and over and over again. After strangling Diane, Wade Wilson pushed her out of the car and then drove over her body multiple times to make her look as mangled and unrecognizable as possible. He then hid her under some shrubs to try and conceal what he did. Now, as all of this was happening, as Wade was out and murdering Diane for literally no reason, Melissa, his girlfriend, was still in contact with him. Remember, he was doing all of this after stopping at the girlfriend's place of work and assaulting her and as she is speaking with police about what happened. She had been trying to get him to come back to her work to talk, but Wade knew that it wasn't a good idea for him to just go straight back there because he probably knew that she had called the police. Instead, he went across the street to a local crab shack to watch from there. Once police realized he was across the street, they went and spoke to him. Now, at that time, police only knew about Melissa's assault. Again, all of these things that I'm telling you was all happening within a very short period of time. So another officer approached him and asked him about what was going on, and he acted like he had no idea what the officer was talking about. Wade then managed to get away from the officer and immediately headed to Mateo Graphics to ask John Lukic for help escaping. As we know, it was at that time that Josh then calls the police to report Wade. By the time officers arrive, he is not there. Instead, Wade ran away on foot and headed towards a neighborhood just behind the business complex buildings. In that neighborhood, he broke into a vacant home. Lucky enough for the couple that lived in that home, they had just left to go out of town the day prior, so they weren't there when this violent maniac broke in. Inside the home, Wade ate some food, changed his clothes, and made some calls to his dad to ask for help. But while on the call with his father, Wade told him everything he has done. He describes that he had just killed two women and beat another. He talks about how he wrapped one of them up in blankets and how he ran over the other woman in the car. By that point, law enforcement had already contacted Wade's father to inquire about his whereabouts, but of course, when they initially contacted him, the dad didn't know where Wade was. But now, with Wade asking for an Uber and telling his dad what he had done, he knew where to find him. So he did end up contacting law enforcement, giving them the address to find Wade. Officers then arrived shortly after. Wade was still on the phone with his father when they arrived, and his father did encourage him to step outside and surrender, so Wade did just that. At this time, Wade Wilson was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder for Christine and Diane, one count of battery for his assault on Melissa, one count of grand theft auto for Christine's car, and one count of burglary of a dwelling from breaking and entering into that home. By now, I've told you a lot about what was going on within literally the span of less than 24 hours. It's kind of a mess to keep track of everything that went on, so just real quick to summarize, on the night of October 6th, Wade and his girlfriend Melissa were at the Buddha bar when they got into a huge fight. After the fight, at some point, Wade introduced himself as JR to Christine and Stephanie and eventually Jason. They all got to talking, and by the end of the night, Wade took Melissa's car to head to Jason's place with the group. My thought, again, is that Jason probably drove them there in Melissa's car because, again, Wade didn't know how to drive a stick. Once at Jason's, Christine and Wade hooked up. A few hours later, Jason asked the three of them to go home. Wade attempted to drive the stick but couldn't, so they called an Uber to Christine's. Once there, Stephanie asked Christine if she was okay. There were absolutely no red flags. Again, Wade was acting charming, friendly, and normal. So Christine felt just fine being left alone with him. But as soon as Stephanie left, Wade viciously attacked Christine, strangling her and beating her to death. He then wrapped her up in those sheets and clothes. He tried dragging her to her own car to put her in the trunk, but was unable, so he just left her there. After that, he took her phone and car. He used that phone to then call his girlfriend, Melissa, over and over and over again until she agreed to meet him at her work. There, he brutally attacked Melissa, probably trying to kill her. He tried dragging her into the car, but she was able to escape. She was beaten, but thankfully fled with her life. 911 was called, but Wade got away. 
After leaving the spa, he somehow spotted Diane walking down the street. He approached her and she ended up in his car. He then strangled her before driving down the road, pushing her out of the car and running her over numerous times. After that, he went to the crab shack where he watched his girlfriend from afar. An officer approached him, but he was able to get away. He was spooked, so he went to Mateo Graphics to see if his acquaintance, Josh, will help him get away. He instead calls the police, so Wade runs to a nearby home, breaks in, and asks his dad for help. Instead, his father gives him up to the police, who then arrest him. By November of 2019, a month after his arrest, he was indicted on his charges by a grand jury. It took almost five years to get his case to trial, but finally, by June 10th, 2024, the trial for the murders and battery started, and the prosecution in this case was seeking the death penalty. Now, I want to note that Wade's appearance changed throughout the time that he was in jail awaiting trial. His appearance is a big part of why this case went so huge, especially during the trial. When he was arrested in 2019, he only had neck tattoos, nothing on his face yet. During his first court appearance a month later, he had a swastika on his head. By 2013, he looks to have lost some weight with his hair grown enough to cover the head tattoo and only show his neck tattoos. But by 2024, he is fully decked out in face tattoos. He has some stitches going from his mouth. He has the words ha 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 on his temple, a smaller swastika under his eye, among other awful tattoos. Obviously, all of these other face tattoos were done in prison. So now going back to the trial, the prosecution outlined everything that I've told you up to this point, the entire timeline, how the investigation started and ended. They brought forward the witnesses who interacted with him that night. Stephanie and Jason both testified saying that when they met him, he was charming and likable. They had no idea that he had just had this big fight with a girlfriend. He went out of his way to make them like him. They brought forward Josh who talked about Wade's confession and trying to escape. His girlfriend, Melissa, also testified. She talked about how horrifying the attack was, saying she knew she was going to die that day if she didn't get away. And as scary as it is, she's probably right. Then Wade's biological father testified. According to him, he and Wade's mother were not ready to raise a child when they had Wade, so they put him up for adoption. He was adopted by a family who raised him, but when Wade was older, he found and reached out to his biological father. The two met and would occasionally have phone calls and eventually developed a relationship. However, eventually, this relationship turned more so into his father just giving him money and helping him out financially. On the day of October 7th, he testified that Wade called him and told him everything he had just done. At first, though, he only really told his father, I'm a killer, and then he talked about two women who were no longer alive. At first, his father didn't really think he was telling the truth. He was known to be a little bit of a storyteller, so he thought that that's what this was. During that first call, he had no emotion in his voice. He sounded completely flat, so he didn't believe him at that time. But then, Wade called him again a bit later, and this time he went into much more detail. When speaking about Christine, he said that he had met a girl at a bar and then went home with her. She eventually fell asleep, but once she was asleep, he got on top of her and started strangling her to death. After killing her, he said that he tried putting her in the trunk of her own car, but he couldn't lift her up because rigor mortis had started kicking in. So he left her there and took her phone and car. He then talked about Diane's murder. He said that he saw Diane walking down the street when he pulled over and asked her for directions. He said that she willingly got into the car after he asked for directions, but he could have been lying. He could have forced her into the car. We don't actually know. But once she got into the car, he immediately started strangling her. He then drove around and searched for a place to dump her body until he ultimately found one. But as he pulled her out of the car to dump her body, he realized that she was still alive and breathing. So he put her on the ground and started running her over until she looked like spaghetti. That is what Wade's father reports Wade said. As he is telling his dad about the murders, he sounded excited. His father felt that he was trying to get him to be excited and happy about what he did as well. 
he showed absolutely no remorse, not an ounce of regret. Obviously, he was very, very disturbed about all of this. Initially, as a gut reaction, his father wanted to help him. He didn't want to turn him in. But after hearing how excited and proud Wade was of these vicious attacks, he decided to turn him in. He couldn't live with himself if he helped his son after doing such horrific things. At the trial, after hearing from all of these witnesses and going over the details of what exactly these women went through at his hands, the prosecution argued that Wade did all of this because he simply enjoyed watching his victims suffer. He enjoyed the pain and terror he inflicted on these women. And I do want to point out that all throughout the trial, throughout his own father testifying, family members crying, and witnesses talking about the murders, Wade was either straight-faced, grinning, or smiling. He was smug the entire time. He also did put on a bit of makeup over his offensive tattoos, but really didn't put much actual effort into covering them. He clearly was proud of the horrible, disgusting person he is. He is proud of what he did to those women. He was enjoying it, hearing the family members suffering and hearing the gruesome details of his crimes. The way in which the defendant killed both of these women was extremely and outrageously wicked and shockingly evil and vile. Both murders were especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel. The defendant chose his victims and acted in a way that shocks the conscience of any human who hears the facts and sees the evidence that you saw and heard in this case. On the other hand, the defense argued that Wade is a sick man. He suffers from neurocognitive brain impairments, most likely caused from brain injuries sustained as a child from sports injuries and a car accident. He had a history of mood swings and behavioral issues starting in adolescence, once even being admitted on a psychiatric hold to a hospital when he was a teenager. One psychiatrist testified at trial that Wade exhibited paranoid and delusional behaviors. In one session, they had to cut their time short because Wade believed he was being spied on. They also talked about how doctors in the prison diagnosed him with schizoaffective disorder, depression, anxiety, and adjustment disorder for which he was taking medications. They also talked about his face tattoos, which clearly show antisocial personality traits. However, other experts testified that even though he showed some delusional behaviors during counseling sessions, no prison staff or other inmates saw any sort of paranoid behaviors or saw any other signs of mental illness. It is known that he abused drugs, which again sort of ties into not being the most mentally healthy, but that isn't really relevant to the crimes that he committed. One psychiatrist testified that he did not believe there was enough evidence to diagnose Wade with any sort of mental health disorder, let alone schizoaffective disorder. Basically, in the trial, the defense wasn't really arguing that Wade was innocent. They were arguing that he did commit all of these crimes, but that he didn't deserve the death penalty because he's mentally ill. But by the end of the five-day long trial, the jury went off for deliberations. It took the jury two hours to find Wade Wilson guilty on all charges, including two counts of first-degree murder, one count of battery, one count of grand theft auto, and one count of burglary of a dwelling. After this, the jury had to deliberate his sentence, whether he would serve life or death. And after only 30 minutes, the jury decided that Wade Wilson should be put to death for his murderous rampage committed against these two innocent women. The state of Florida versus Wade Wilson, jury verdict form, penalty phase. We, the jury, unanimously find that the state has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the first degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Yes. We, the jury, unanimously found the state proved one or more aggravating factors. We, the jury, find by a vote of 9 to 3 that Wade Wilson should be sentenced to death. When being handed down this verdict, Wade didn't even flinch, didn't bat an eye. He sat through the entire trial and sentencing without a care in the world. He didn't feel bad about what he did. He didn't care about the impact it had on the families that will have to live with this trauma for the rest of their lives. 
Christine Wel Melton was my best friend and my cousin until October 7th, 2019. There are no words to describe the absolutely lovely Christine Ann Melton, but I will try. She was precious, not just to me, to everyone who knew her. Christine was remarkably funny, had a quick wit and an entirely unique personality. If you were with her, you laughed. Christine was strong, brave, independent, and loyal. She was the friend you wished you had. She was the friend who got more fired up about your problems than you did. She was fiercely protective and always on your side, even if you were wrong. We have sat through graphic testimony and heard all of the positively gruesome details of how our girl met our end. And I sit here today and I listen because that's what Christine would have done. She would have sacrificed her sanity to see justice done. And so I have done the same. My mother supported my dreams and only ever wanted me to succeed in life. She always reassured me that my life wasn't gonna end if I got a C in math. She always made sure that all the hard work I was putting into my ed education wasn't going unnoticed. She would always show up with random gifts that helped me and succeeded in my life. My mother was a single mother who, who only ever wanted not only for her family but everybody around her to be happy. I lived five years without her and not a single day has gone by where I haven't been able to not think about her. My mother only loved, only had love in her heart, only wanted the best for me and nothing that happened to her was ever deserved and she just wanted to live a normal life. As of right now, Wade's formal sentencing hearing is scheduled to take place on July 23rd. So as of right now, whether or not Wade will actually face the death penalty is still up in the air even though the jury felt it was appropriate for this case. As with any case that still has some loose ends, I will keep you all updated as information comes out, most likely by updating the description or I'll add a pinned comment. But as of right now, that is all of the information we have on today's case. I know this was a wild ride and it's just so tragic to hear. It seems that this one fight with his girlfriend sent him into a rage that he turned around and took out on two other women. Two women who didn't even know him, who weren't even the targets of his anger. Two women who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He felt entitled to these women's lives because he couldn't control his own emotions. I do truly believe he tried to kill Melissa that day. And maybe because she got away, he took his anger out once again on Diane. Or maybe he would have done it anyways, regardless of if he killed Melissa, because clearly killing one person wasn't enough for him. It's such a horrific case, and my heart absolutely goes out to Christine's family, Diane's family, Melissa, and everyone else affected by the actions of this sick, twisted, violent murderer. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to hear what you all think. Why do you think this happened? Do you think he was trying to kill Melissa? And what do you think of him getting the death penalty? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.